Uh, good morning. Allow me to start uh, our today's events despite uh, our schedule. We are still waiting for uh, Dr. Ayanto Patun who is supposed to open this, this round table. But uh, let me, not to, let me uh, welcome you in this round table discussion. Uh, my name is Awidya Santika Jaya. I am a uh, student at uh, NU SA Pasir College of Diplomacy. I am uh, Mas Denny Priyawan, organized uh, Indonesia Synergy uh, in, co in close cooperation with Indo ANU Indonesian Students Association. We have this uh, today's roundtable uh, discussion. Uh, the idea of having this roundtable came uh, two or three weeks ago. I had lunch with Denny and uh, we evaluated uh, our programs. In the last couple months, uh, we already had a lot of programs, discussions, seminars, conferences, but mainly the speakers are, you know, very reputable, um, high level, and then the yeah, professors, basically, uh, those who have high profiles. We um, rarely provide opportunity for young scholars like all of us to present their kind of works. So we have, we are very lucky today. We have. 12 presenters. Most of them are first year PhD students, Mahasiswa Baru, and I'm an old, old student. And then also uh, some master students. They have various backgrounds and various research interests from environment to international security, from science to uh, politics. So I would like to thank ANU Indonesia Project, Pak Arianto Patundrum is there and also uh, to Indonesian Embassy, pa, Professor Roni uh, Nurrahman, for providing us general support. And also for uh, presenters. Presenters have worked very hard in the last couple of days. They provide abstracts, PowerPoints, even some of them provide full paper as well. So I really appreciate your hard work. Without further ado, I would like to invite Pak Arianto Patanru, Head of the ANU Indonesia project to give a uh, history mark. Thank you. Uh, Selamat pagi. Uh, good morning. Uh, sorry for being late. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate the Indonesia Synergy uh, for organizing this event. We at the Indonesia project very much value this kind of activities, extend ideas, uh, discussion and uh, presentation. So uh, we would like to support uh, these activities as much as, as we can. And we wish you all a very productive and useful uh, workshop today. Thank you. Uh, for the first session, uh, we will have Professor Edward Espinel, who will provide us a keynote lecture on uh, how to publish your research uh, in the journals. I will not introduce uh, Professor Espinel. He is already popular, knowledgeable, reputable, and very charming. So, <laughs> we will have 30 minutes, and probably uh, Professor Espinel will have we provide like 20 minutes for the lecture and uh, we'll be followed by discussion. Please. Okay, thank you. And uh, thank you for that very nice uh, introduction. And I should warn you, I, I don't know if I'm charming, but I usually speak for too long. So you have to warn me uh, if I'm going close to my 20 minutes. Uh, 
I think increasingly important in Indonesia as well. That is getting published in international journals. So many of you would already have some experience uh, in this field, but some of you might not yet have published. Uh, so I thought I would give uh, some advice. Um, but before we get started, I just wanted to tell you that there are three golden rules you must always remember uh, when considering uh, getting published uh, in a journal. The first one is, of course, that your primary goal here at the ANU is to get your thesis written. So if there's going to be a major conflict uh, between writing your thesis and your journal, you should always prioritise your thesis. Uh, and I'm saying that partly because I'm a supervisor of so just remember that you might need to put this off until after you submit it. So it depends a lot on your progress. Uh, sometimes uh, students can uh, prepare a journal article while they're going. Uh, sometimes they have to wait. It really depends on your progress. And above all, the most important rule of, course, of all, of course, is talk to your supervisor about it. Your supervisor will be able to judge uh, whether you're in a position before you submit uh, to uh, start working on a journal article or whether you should wait. Now, why do we get published? Why do we try and publish in a journal article? What are some of the main reasons? To increase our impact. To increase our impact, okay, because you can reach out to a broader audience, you can share your ideas, uh, etc. Uh, absolutely. Uh -huh. What else? To be knowledgeable like you. To be knowledgeable, I love you. To be known. To get feedbacks from other scholars. Exactly. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And that's right. So all of those things are right, I think. Uh, and I, I think you all chose a very noble uh, 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 reasons. Uh, but one thing as well, of course, is that journal publication is really important for academic careers. Less important if after the completing your PhD or your master's, you're going back to a government position or some other sort of position. But we know that uh, journal publications are one of the key measurements uh, that are used in most university systems around the world as a sort of proxy uh, for research accomplishment. It's really important in Australia to get a job, to have some good journal uh, publications. And we know for the DICTI uh, measurements and promotions and everything in universities in Indonesia, it's also increasingly important. So you started with all the very noble ideas. I started with the very, uh, what's the word, the very practical. Uh, status as well. Uh, um, uh, depending on what journals you publish in, they can often be seen as a sort of proxy for your academic status because some journals are very, very difficult uh, to get accepted. Uh, and then we have the sort of reasons uh, that you um, uh, have already me measured, uh, mentioned to reach out to new audiences, to communicate your ideas, uh, especially to scholarly audiences, uh, and so forth. What to publish? So I do, I. Um, I'm on the editorial board of a couple of, of journals, uh, but I also do a lot of reviewing of journal articles. Um, any academic, once you become a bit more established, you get asked to be um, a reviewer uh, for journals quite a lot. Um, and a lot of uh, submissions to journal articles uh, get rejected because the authors haven't actually done very well uh, uh, even in choosing a basic topic. The key thing here is it's got to present new knowledge. You've got to do something that's original, that hasn't been done a lot before. Uh, it sounds like a very simple and obvious point, but you would be amazed by uh, if you knew how many submissions to Indonesian or Southeast Asian politics journals make the basic argument, for example, that Decentralization has not affected uh, the basic distribution of political power in Indonesia and the old former oligarchs and bureaucrats from the new order system are still dominant in local governments. We've heard that a thousand times before, but many people are still submitting articles to journals which just repeat that basic point. So if you're repeating an argument that's already well known or established in the, in the, in the literature, there's not much point, you probably won't get uh, accepted. Journal articles also tend to be very, uh, pretty short. You know? 
Uh, unlike a thesis, which can be up to 100,000 words for a dissertation, a PhD dissertation, and you can present very complex and multifaceted um, uh, arguments. Uh, most journal articles are, you know, six, eight, ten, sometimes 12,000 words. Uh, so you have very limited space. So one of the key things is to present a very clear, punchy, focused, central argument. And usually, that's another reason actually why a lot of journal submissions. Uh, get rejected because you read the abstract well there's a lot of things going on there it's not a single clear argument and then you read through the, uh, the, uh, the body of the article and you find again that the author hasn't really decided what the most important thing they want to say is um, the final point you've got to address a broader literature or a broader audience uh, a lot of this is another problem uh, we see a lot of journal submissions which say focus on, I don't know, uh, Santran education in uh, southeast Sulawesi. Oh. Interesting analysis of Pesantran education in southeast Sulawesi, for instance. But so what? No? Unless you're from southeast uh, Sulawesi, or unless you're particularly interested in that topic, who cares? So you've got to address a broader literature in some way. It doesn't mean your topic can't be very focused and even very narrow, but you have to be able to locate it within a broader literature. What does your study tell us about the bigger topic, which could be uh, the nature of religious education or uh, uh, the role of the Santrans in Indonesian society or whatever it is? Co-author or single author, that's something else you need to think about. Um, uh, it can sometimes be a, a, a good thing uh, for you to co-author, uh, sometimes with your supervisor. Uh, many, some of you might already have experience with this. Uh, that can often work out quite well, especially if you have a lot of good data, but perhaps you're not so experienced in um, uh, writing for an academic audience in English, for connecting your arguments to bigger literature or whatever. But just remember that one thing is that, you know, later on when you need to claim credit for that, for that article, some people might be thinking, well, you know, he or she was really relying on their supervisor there. Um, but still, as a tr sort of a training method, as a first time, uh, uh, it can often be very rewarding. Okay, so how does it relate to, so, okay, I said before your main job is writing your thesis. So if you're thinking of writing a journal article either during or immediately after uh, you've done all your research for your thesis, how does a journal how could a journal article fit with your thesis? What part of your thesis? How do you how do you relate a journal article to your thesis? Any ideas? There's about three, there's several different options I think. Would it be on the same topic as your thesis? Yeah. Right. You're spending all your time thinking about your thesis topic, so basically it needs to be very, it should be very closely related, I think. But, well, let me tell you, I think there's three basic options. A chapter. Now, it's often the easiest option. You might have a chapter which, okay, it's Im embedded within the big body of your thesis, um, but it could stand alone as a journal article. You'd have to change, you obviously would have to change the way you frame it. Um, because you can't, it's no longer embedded within the whole structure of the introduction, your argument and so on. Uh, so you would have to reframe it. But that's often the easiest way to go uh, to think about publishing a, an article uh, while you're in the process of uh, preparing a thesis. Another model which can be quite challenging but can also be quite helpful uh, for you. Uh, let's say you've come back uh, from uh, the field, you've done your thesis proposal, you've done your first field work, and you're starting to put your thesis together, working out how it all fits up, what your fits together, what your big argument is, and so on. Well, one one way of writing, of helping you write your thesis, actually, is to try and write a compact overview piece, uh, focusing just on your main argument uh, from your thesis and the major pieces of, of evidence. 
uh, and submit that. So it's sort of like a mini version of your thesis with just the, uh, the main lines of arguments embodied in it. The other thing which is sometimes attempted uh, is you could write a, a journal article on a side project. Say you're going, uh, you're doing your research on, um, you go to the field, you do your field work and it's on an environmental um, conflict in a particular province, but while you're there you happen also to collect a lot of material on some other issue, maybe the recent Pintada or whatever it is. Um, one temptation is to think, well, that's not really going to fit in my thesis, but I collected a lot of data on it. Why don't I write a, thesis, a journal chapter uh, on that anyway? Again, you should talk to your supervisor about this, but generally speaking, I think that's not a recommended course of, uh, of action to take during your thesis. You can spend a lot of time doing work on something that is not actually related to your thesis proper. It can be a distraction and an obstacle to you. So if you've collected material on something that's not directly related to your thesis and you want to publish it, wait. So that's like, can't this to do? Okay, any questions so far? How am I going for time? Only 10 minutes, right? Where do you publish? A few considerations here. Journal status. Uh, I don't know what, it, what, what the DICTI system is. Does DICTI, I know DICTI has a list of accredited international journals, right? But do they rank them? Yeah. There is a ranking, right? Okay. So I'm not really familiar with that ranking. There's a lot of different ranking systems. Australia has a ranking system. It's called the ERA, the... Um, up there. The ERA. Excellent in research. Assessment. 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 Something like that anyway. <laughs> uh, 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 it used to be a single national list and journals would be ranked A star, A, B, C, D, uh, except maybe no D actually. Uh, and of course it's very important in Australia to try and target the A and the A star journals. Now it's done by the disciplinary uh, association. So for example the the field I'm from, the Australian Political Science Association, it does that ranking and you can uh, find it on the internet and see the different ranking systems. So, career so there's a dilemma here, right? Career-wise, it tends to be best to go for the higher ranking journals. But the higher ranking journals are much harder to get into. If you go for one of the, so again, my field is political science, if you go for one of the really top journals, uh, like World Politics, uh, which is uh, published in the United States, their acceptance rate is only about 5%. So they receive 20 journal submissions and they reject 19, including from me, unfortunately. Um, uh, uh, so it's, it's harder. You can waste a lot of time uh, trying to get into the bigger, the more uh, prestigious journals. Um, and in the end still not get accepted. So that's one trade-off you have to think about. Um, uh, again, uh, the best source of example, will, uh, best source of advice uh, will be your supervisor. And then there are other things you need to think about. You go for a very specialised journal that uh, focuses on, say, a, a, just a very uh, particular sub-discipline that you're interested in, you know, electoral politics versus uh, I don't know, uh, a general politics journal, for example. Disciplinary or area studies. Um, uh, so there are some, some journals which focus just on Indonesia, or just on Southeast Asia, or just on the Asia-Pacific region. The rule of thumb is generally, again, although some of them are quite difficult, the general rule is they, they well, it depends on the status, actually. I was going to say they're easier to get accepted in, but it really depends on the status of the journal. Um, uh, but often you will find um, the advantage of the area studies journal is that they're going to be interested not only in what your contribution to theory is, they'll also be interested in what your contribution to knowledge about Indonesia or Southeast Asia is as well. Um, key thing is know the audience for the journal you target. You know? So 
you know, if you write something as if it's directed towards an audience of Indonesia specialists and submit it to a political science journal, yeah, of course, you won't be accepted. Okay. What are the steps when we publish? Some of you have it, has anyone some of you must have published already, right, in international journals. So anyone published already in a journal? Uh-huh. So you'll be familiar with this process I'm going to talk about. Um, Okay, so what happens, usually now, most journals will have a sub, uh, on their web page, will have a submission um, uh, site where you can upload your journal, uh, your submission, and usually they then go through a process of double-blind review. So, you don't know who the reviewers are, and the reviewers don't know who you are. So when you sub uh, upload your article, you have to take your name off, and all identifying information. Um, uh, and then, once the review, uh, the review, sometimes it's two reviewers, sometimes it's three, sometimes it's even four. There are usually, uh, let me think, well, there are basically three basic outcomes. Reject, which is very common. Don't get too sad if you get a rejection. It happens to everybody. Usually you need to think about what they said to you and maybe then resubmit it to another journal. Uh, the most common is revise and resubmit. So the reviewers will make criticisms of your article, say, oh, this article neglects some important bodies of literature, or there's something wrong with the argument, this part isn't logical, this part, whatever it is. And remember, there can be three or four reviewers, they're often saying very separate and different things. Um, but you get an opportunity to resubmit the article, after which either the editors make a judgment or the reviewers make a judgment on whether it's accepted. The third possibility is we love this article and we're going to accept it and publish it as it is. That almost never happens. You almost always will get revised and resubmit if you are lucky. Uh, you often also will just get rejected. Uh, so then, after uh, you get the, those, uh, let's assume you get a revise and resubmit, usually then you have to write to the editor, say, yes, I accept these points, I'm going to make the following amendments. Then, if he or she agrees, you can go through that resubmission process. Often it's then assessed again, um, and then you go to the final editing and production. Key point here is it can take a long time. Two years is not unusual between the moment you submit then you go through several rounds of revisions and then when you're finished you think okay they're ready to publish and then they'll say dear professor at Aspinall we will publish uh, your, uh, your, your article in our journal which is coming out in 13 months time because there's often a queue you know? so it can take a long time actually uh, even if everything goes well okay this is just uh, oh, oh, I have made some copies of this, so I'll hand it out later. Um, this is just a very typical uh, set of instructions for a reviewer uh, for a journal. Uh, this was for uh, the journal Pacific Affairs, so it's sort of a politics, international relations, cross Asia Pacific studies journal. Uh, and these are the criteria that are given to the reviewers, people like me or whoever, uh, when they are assessing articles that come in. Uh, look at the, and they're very, this is a very typical set of suggestions. First one, is the subject appropriate? You would not believe many people send journals to the, send articles to the wrong journal. You know, it's not the sort of topic uh, that we're interested in. You know, if you send an article on a very detailed question of public administration to this journal, they'll just say, no, it's not really relevant. Argument, is it new? Remember that point I said before? Originality is everything. If you're just saying something that's been said many times before, no journal will want to publish what, what, you're, what you're saying. Um, again, empirical sources, is the information new? Or if it's not new, um, is it uh, a new argument? Is it a new interpretation based on familiar data? Structure and organization, writing, um, and then larger implications. This is an important one as well. Again, it's really about the, uh, the audience of the journal, because the journal also has its own goals. The journal might be targeting particular uh, sorts of audience. 
And this one is the kind of piece that could engage many different sorts of scholars, policy uh, people, and so on. So every journal has its own sort of audience in mind, uh, and you need to think about that. <clears throat> so a few final tips about uh, publication. Um, read before you write. By that, I mean you have to know the relevant literature. You know, remember that they're going to be um, sending your piece to experts in the field. So if, you're, if it's obvious that you are not familiar with things that have been written in the field already, or that you're just repeating things, arguments that have been made by other scholars, the reviewers are going to know that, because they're going to uh, be familiar with the existing literature. So you have to know uh, the, the field, and you have to be able to contribute something uh, uh, to it. Know your journals as well. Again, this is already just repeating the point I've already made. Make sure you match the topic with your journal. And if you're, if you're, um, and usually you'll know the sort of journal you want to submit to. It's probably the journal where you're reading a lot of articles. You know? If in your research field you're reading a lot of articles from a particular journal, well, that's probably the journal or one of them that you should be targeting. Think about who's going to be reading uh, the article, what sort of background information, what sort of contextualization you need to include in your piece. Think about your reviewers, you know, don't overthink this, uh, but have in the back of your mind if you're writing an article on Nadatul Ulama and politics in Indonesia, it's very likely that one reviewer will be Professor Greg Feely from this field building over here, or whatever it is, you know. There's um, he's an established expert in that field. Uh, locate yourself within the literature and then use the standard structure to write. Abstract, in introduction, topic review, argument and conclusion. And the final point I wanted to make, oh, apparently it's not the final point, English language expression of course has to be good. Um, uh, that can be challenging if you're not a native speaker, uh, but a lot of Journals just won't invest time in detailed copy editing. So you've got to make sure you get that uh, right before you uh, submit. So the key thing is to present a clear original argument with a single main message, single fo focused main message or argument, and use your abstract as a writing tool. Do I have two more minutes? Yes. All right. So I want to just to illustrate this, this point. You don't have to read all of that now. I've got a, um, I've got a, I distributed copies of this. And the point I'm trying to make here is that for me, people do, the, do these things differently, but for me, one of the things, I know I'm in a position to write a journal, a journal article on a particular topic if I can write an abstract. So for me, I always try and write the abstract first. And that is a writing tool. It helps you set out what your argument is going to be. Um, so, and the abstract is often the key. You can often tell, as a reviewer, you can often tell whether an article is going to be accepted or not just by reading the abstract. If the abstract's not clear, you can bet the article is not going to be clear. So, I just wanted to just walk you through uh, this uh, example from my colleague. I'm sure many of you know him. Uh, Marcus Mietzner, this is an article he uh, wrote in um, the journal Democratization, which I think is like an A-ranked uh, journal uh, in the political science uh, field. And he has this very neat summary, just in five sentences, of what his article is about. Let's go through it. What's he doing here? Setting the background. The yeah, setting the background of the context. It's almost like a miniature literature review. He's saying this is the state of the existing knowledge. And you, he'll be doing this in the article. He'll be doing have a little section on this in the article where he substantiates this uh, with his assessment, with uh, citations from the literature. Next step, what does he do here? Mm -hmm. 
the gap. Yeah, exactly. So he's saying, here's the existing state of knowledge, here's the existing state of literature, but here's my challenge. I think there's something wrong about this literature, or I'm offering a new uh, uh, situation that needs to be analysed. Then, next. This argument. Sorry? This argument. Exactly. Summary of the argument, which will be, you know, probably about 60% of the article will be taken up by this. And then. It's not exactly. Um, a conclusion, what is it? Broader implications. Yeah. What are the lessons of this argument for a broad, broad body of literature, or in this case for a development agencies and the policy world? So I think that's a good piece of advice. It's good for trying to even work out a longer piece of writing, like a PhD dissertation, to try and play around constantly with like a, a very summarized version of your entire piece of work. Um, but if you want to write a, a shorter piece, like a journal article, it's really helpful to try and start with the abstract. If you can't get the abstract right, it probably means you haven't quite worked out what your uh, contribution is, what your context is, who you're trying to speak to, and what your argument uh, is going to be. All right, so that was it from me. I hope that was useful. Thank you. As I said, please. It was a charming presentation. <laughs> so, uh, one or two questions, please. We'll speak for a limited time. Okay, it's so. uh, Thank you. Uh, um, my name is Olin. I'm from Penal School of Environmental Society. I wonder if uh, you know if uh, we have thesis by computations uh, approach, so we right. don't have to write the uh, traditional thesis. Right. That's what I'm planning to do. So, you have to write several articles, several right? articles and How many? Put we will do three, three or four. Yeah. And then we just uh, put it in, 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 uh, in as a chapter in this. Right. My question is, uh, uh, I, I, I I never seen uh, because this is new also mm -hmm. to, to my school. And how how should I? So my problem is uh, like you said in in uh, journal article you cannot put a lot of things there. So yeah. Focusing on one. Uh, and then that's it. But you know, if, if you want to talk about the PSD projects, it's, you, know, you have to talk about many things. And, then, and you know, how, how you deal with it? Yeah, I don't know. I've not had experience with that. I mean, I know that it's a new sort of a trend, um, and um, uh, happening not just at the ANU, but many universities uh, internationally. I met a PhD student from Cornell just a couple of weeks ago who's doing the same thing. So um, it does make the project rather different, I think, because you can, um, although all your research is in the same topic area, you're, you're, you're having three or four lines of research rather than a big integrated whole. Um, I, I could imagine there would be problems with sort of repetition between the different articles. That might be one problem that you're, if you're speaking to the same sort of literature every time, how do you make sure that the, article, the articles are overlapping a lot or repeating themselves a lot? Um, yeah, I don't know. Does anyone else have experience with this approach and have anything to add? I've never dealt with it. I, I, yeah, I can see pluses and minuses of it. Pluses are that you get, as part of the PhD process, you're getting your exposure, your international publications. Um, uh, another plus would be you're working on smaller pieces. You don't have to, one of the challenging things in a PhD is often trying to fit everything together so it makes a single story. Um, uh, but yeah, one of the challenges is precisely the same thing, I guess, that your work would become a bit disconnected. I don't know, my son, Joe, do you have experience in that? Do articles and stuff? I also did that actually back in... You did it? Yeah. Wow. I, I wrote my dissertation in 2003, yeah. and I also had essays. Uh, and the good thing about it is, as Ed said, that it's quite the 
it's relatively more ready for publications, but the, the downside is, of course, there are some repetitions in each chapter. But usually, the way to to, to deal with this is you to have the over arch the overall uh, idea in the first chapter, and then the second and the uh, later chapters is like a single uh, essay actually, and it helps you a lot when you want to publish. I published four mm -hmm. uh, papers out of at this dissertation. Quite, I think, quite relatively easier than if you have a single. But the good thing of with single, uh, you know, integrated dissertation is it is. It is more in, enjoyable to read, oh, right? And then, it, you know, it's it's also very very good as a contribution to to, to, to scholars to read the, the whole article. But they say it's good for you if you really want to publish. Mm -hmm. And you just have to submit. You don't have to get them accepted, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Some have to be accepted. Some have to be accepted. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, we have to move to another session. And thank you very much, Ed, for uh, your presentation. <laughs> for the first session, I'm going to invite Danny to meet uh, the other uh, speakers. Yosa uh, and Ahmad.
my name is Ahmad and um, I just started my PhD last three and a half months. So this idea is still really rough and I hopefully from this uh, discussion I can get more inputs on my research plan. So my uh, I slightly changed my title a bit. So my PhD will be about understanding the processes of environmental injustices in other conflicts in Indonesia with uh, hopefully get implication for policy and conflict management. My supervisor is Professor Associate Professor John McCarthy from Harvard School. So, uh, agrarian conflicts or natural resource conflict in Mesa is pervasive and widespread. Uh, I think I can just highlight from these uh, two media coverage. Is first is that the intensity level of conflict is quite high. Uh, it's indicated by some violence. Some people die, some people injured, and some people arrested because of this conflict. And another thing is these conflicts are not new. It's been for a couple of decades already. Uh, it means that the current conflict management mechanism doesn't work really effective. So this is how the agrarian conflict analysis look like. Uh, this is from the data from 2013 from uh, NGO Huma. As we can see here, it's the agrarian conflict across uh, different sectors, and but if we can see the trend is that conflict in plantation, oil farm, and forestry plantation dominate the dominate the agrarian conflict, which is will be my focus will be on plantation. Uh, oil palm and forestry plantation conflict. So what is agrarian conflict? Agrarian conflicts are normally used by uh, land reform activists uh, referring to conflicting claims over land or natural resources of or territory which often involve uh, dispute between local communities and also powerful actors like corporation or uh, state. Uh, the previous the existing studies has already found some uh, structural uh, dri a driver or underlying causes of these conflicts, such as unequal distribution of benefit and harm of the environmental uh, management, exclusion from resource access, exclusion from decision making, improper process of land acquisition or appropriation, competing property right claims lack of recognition of the right holders, for example, indigenous people. And, but if we look at this, uh, all key drivers, we can see that this is all about injustices. So this is confirmed the link of injustice and conflict in natural resources. Another key guess that, uh, from the earlier studies is that uh, they tend to look at conflict, the cause conflict more on structural uh, causes and not much uh, looking at it from processual uh, aspect of conflict. This doesn't answer, for example, why some conflict escalate into violence and why some other peacefully resolve. What are the trigger and accelerator, accelerator of these uh, conflicts? So this research will try to combine uh, the analysis of structural analysis and processual analysis of conflict to understand uh, yeah, the, both the dynamic and also the structural and processual dynamic of the conflict. So basically, processual analysis is based on the assumption that conflict is developed through different stages and from to move from one stage to, to higher level stages or to lower level, there, there are uh, triggers and also accelerators. So the research aim of this uh, research will be about to examine the underlying uh, social, economic, and political processes that generate and also ameliorate, ameliorate or resolve the environmental injustice in agrarian conflict in Indonesia. And this research will focus on oil palm and industrial plantation industrial forestry plantation companies. 
some research question. This is still uh, my initial research question. First is actually about the view or the perspective of uh, conflict stakeholder of what they think of the injustices that happen and their experience and what factors influence the perception and appraisal of justice and injustices. Second question, now what are the ultimate or structural, socio-economic and political processes and power relation that lead to and shape the nature of injustices in plantation countries? The third question is, how do the socio-economic and political processes escalate and ameliorate the environment of the injustices and conflict? And the last one is, what condition and action need to occur for injustice and conflict to be ultimately ameliorated? So, uh, probably I uh, previously talked about the, the literature, the broader literature that uh, I will contribute is, I will look at, uh, for this analysis, I will look at uh, plantation conflict from three different uh, literature, environmental justice, political ecology, and conflict management. Environmental justice will look at uh, what are the, uh, the dimension of injustices that happening in plantation conflict. And political ecology will look at more on the structural causes of the injustices and conflict. And also conflict management is about how it has been addressed and what are the uh, strengths and weaknesses of the current conflict management uh, processes. And this is, uh, I just tried to look at the, from an ethical framework here, this is a great conflict, and there are different kind of causes, including exclusion mechanism, power relation, global and local market mechanism, which lead to some injustices, distributional injustices, procedural and recognition injustices, and then how it has been managed, and what are the outcomes of these processes. Uh, this is I still uh, working on this uh, about methodology, uh, but I would, this is what I am doing at the moment. I will mix between qualitative and quantitative. I will probably use uh, or identify some three case studies to to answer my research question. Maybe in Sumatra and Kalimantan because this uh, these are where uh, plantation conflict are happening, and the data collection will will include some structured uh, interviews, surveys, focus group discussion and participant observation. Uh, this is what I was thinking about the contribution of this study. It's understanding the nature and pathway, pathways of injustices in agrarian conflicts in Indonesia, understanding of structural and processual dynamic of injustices, and also the innovative use of informal justice uh, in analy and the analysis of conflict. And practically, of course, it's about how to improve the the existing conflict management approach in resolving the... Yeah, uh, this is my last slide. Uh, maybe uh, I still need your help in terms of suggestion on how to make this research more useful, and also suggestion on some potential sites, if you have, uh, please let me know, and also suggestion on material and method for this study, which is I still uh, develop. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmad. Uh, yeah. Now uh, we move to the second uh, speaker, Yosafat Reza Leonard, who will uh, share uh, his research on the assessment of earthquake hazard in the segment of Java trends using high precision global positioning system measurement. Uh, Yosafat, floor is yours.
morning everyone, uh, my name is Yosa. Uh, today I'm going to deliver a presentation about my research on the use of GPS high precision observation to assess the earthquake hazard. So before I begin with my presentation, I would like to share a bit about the late tectonics theory, which becomes the basis for this research. And the tool that, and the tool that I use for this research is GPS. So according to the late tectonics theory, uh, the Earth's outer layer is divided by several rigid bodies we call plates, and these plates are in relative motion with the other plates. And what drives that plate motion? So some interesting theories suggest that the convective current of Earth's mantle that creates the movement on the plates above it. So it works like a conveyor belt that brings uh, the plate from the place it is created, which is the mid-oceanic ridge, to the place it is destroyed, which is on the deep sea trenches. So uh, these plates are traveling above this mantle uh, and destroyed at the subduction zone. And this creates some consequences like earthquake in this uh, interface as well as volcanism in the surface of the earth because of the melting of this subducting slab over here. So this theory actually connects the presence of the earthquake, volcanism, and the creation of the continent and ocean basin. So when the uh, seismologists plot the presence of the earthquake around the globe, they found that this earthquake coincides with the plate boundaries. Yeah, yeah, that's a bit about plate tectonics theory. This is about GPS. Uh, GPS is a positioning and navigation system that can give you 3D coordinates everywhere, every time around the globe as long as there is no obstruction hindering the GPS signal to you. And the basic positioning of this tool is uh, measuring the distance between the satellite and the receiver. Assuming that we know the position of the satellite and we do measure simultaneously uh, the distance between the satellite and the receiver, we can measure the location of the receiver. But this measurement are affected by some errors, such as the orbital errors, satellite clock and receiver clock errors, and <coughs> atmospheric errors because the GPS signal traveling through the atmosphere. And this needs to be removed or eliminated to get a high precision positioning. So you can get a millimeter level of positioning using this method. And by doing continuous, continuous measurement, you can derive the displacement of this station, of the GPS station. And as the displacement is the derivative of the velocity, you can measure the velocity of the GPS station. OK, here we go. So in the segment of Java Trans, the Australian plate is undergoing a subduction beneath the Sundaland block and it creates some consequences such as surface deformation over here at the subduction growth zone. Uh, we can see the development of bridge on the seafloor and assuming that there is a locking on the subduction interface, it will build up a strain accumulation that if it's high enough can be released through the earthquake. However, in Java, the seismicity is considerably low. It is based on the available historical, historical data in seismic reports. It tells that Java have a low potential of earthquake hazard. Um, uh, however, the evidence from 
Japan earthquake in 2011 and Sumatra earthquake in 2004 until 2007, it provides a new evidence about the ultra-long strain accumulation that can rupture every time at a subduction zone, which could be happen in Java as well. We don't know because we have only this piece of seismic records, but the reality probably like this. We cannot determine the seismic hazard only from this small uh, of data. So the seismic of earthquake hazard in Java is important, but it is difficult because we don't have that much data. So a new method needs to be invented to gather this assessment. So on this research, that's what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm trying to understand the kinematic and surface deformation in Java using the GPS high precision uh, observation. And for this, I will try to uh, infer the locking on the subduction zone between the Australian plate and the Sundalen block. So for this, of course, before I use my uh, observation to, to, to assess the earthquake hazard, I need to know um, the, the capability of my GPS network to, to determine the earthquake hazard assessment. As we know that the Java Trans is located about 200 kilometers from the Trans, which is quite far, which, is make, which makes the GPS network could be difficult to, de to detect this kind of locking. So in this research, I will try to, to develop a model to infer for this locking. So if we decompose the GPS velocity, we will understand that the GPS velocity is affected by many motions. Of course, we expect that because the measurements are done on the surface of the Earth, which is the place of the plate tectonics process, or the earthquake, or surface deformation. So we expect that that velocity is disturbed somehow by this geophysical process. And uh, if we make a mathematical model of this presence, we know that there is a considerable amount of block rotation, the plate tectonic motion, and the surface deformation due to the strain accumulation on the subduction interface. Then we need to develop the model to decompose this locking. For, for sure, for example, there is a locking on the subduction interface. For example, this is the Australian plate, this is Sundalen block, and there's a locking there, it will build up an elastic strain accumulation which is detected by the GPS, the high precision GPS and when the strain, the strain is high enough it will be released through the earthquake and this is what I'm doing, I'm trying to decompose the GPS velocity to get that information of locking, the parameters of locking Locking is in there in the GPS velocity, but how far we can determine it using my model. So I'm using about 120 station, continuous station of GPS observation in Java Island, which have been installed by two Indonesian institutions. And uh, I use about seven years of data from 2008 until 2014, I process it with uh, the program called Game and Locate to infer for the velocity and position of the GPS station. From this, I get the daily solution of the GPS observation and for your convenience, we can see this is the measurement from 2008 until 2014 but not all the stations have that long period, like for this station, the Sade station, it's from 2008 until 2012. What interesting about this time series, you can see that in 2012, on the east 
component of the this spatial velocity it is affected by earthquake on 2012 so from this time series it's very convenient to see what are the geophysical process happening on that region and then I combine this daily solution into a single solution to get the velocity field of those sites and this is uh, the reference frame realization because I put the velocity field on a certain reference frame uh, using high quality data from uh, the IGS, the International GNSS Service and then to understand better the surface deformation that happened on Java I define the Sundaland block and this is the surface velocity field of Java with respect to Sundaland block and it shows some interesting features like complex deformation in west of Java in a clockwise style and of course the post seismic effect of 2006 Pangandaran earthquake which we hope the GPS observation can get a linear velocity but due to the post seismic effect there is a small amount of decay here which makes it difficult for us to define the pattern of walking as well so as well there is a mechanism of back thrust here in the north part of Java with the southward motion which suggests that there is a southward motion due to the back thrust on north of Java and then central to east of Java we see the pattern of the velocity here is reflecting the subduction of the Australian plate here this is the Australian plate the velocity on that direction and they reflect somehow a bit of that pattern of walking on that area so to test how sensitive my network for the pattern of locking, I develop a model to calculate uh, the sensitivity of the network. I do the forward modeling first and give this slip pattern on that GPS uh, station and invert it for the inversion to see whether the GPS can produce the same pattern on this uh, model. And as we can see, this model can resolve the pattern quite well and then I increase the resolution to see whether it is more sensitive and I develop I uh, impose this uh, locking pattern and see how well the, the model can resolve it this is quite well blue red blue this is also this is quite well but on this part the GPS station somehow can only resolve the pattern on the south coast of Java up to about 60 kilometers to the south. So from this, my preliminary conclusion is my network can resolve the locking that happened on subduction up to about 68 kilometers from the coastline south of Java with the minimum locking of that 40 kilometers and my station provide good sensitivity along strike direction about 90 kilometers and if the down limit of the down deep limit of the locking zone reaches the depth of 60 of course the GPS network can assess the earthquake hazard in Java what my GPS network can do to resolve the locking the locking pattern in the west of Java as we see there is um, the presence of some active faults on that area as well as the effect of post-seismic motion which makes it difficult to derive this locking pattern so what I will do next is I will try to constrain the variable locking on the southwest part of the trench which is not very sensitive to my network to see whether they can resolve quite well so that's all I can say for today. Thank you.
uh, thank you very much, Yusa, for an interesting and informative uh, presentation. Now we move to the session of discussion and comment. Uh, we are lucky now, we have two distinguished uh, discussion. The first is uh, Mbak Afi Maha Intias, an advisor, climate and land use alliance. Uh, and the second discussion is Pak Rudi Purba, Director of Development Project, AMU8, AMU8. Uh, uh, for the first discussion, I will come back to you. Can we get back to your presentation? Selamat pagi, Bapak dan Ibu. Which part? The first part where you put their problems and identification of the reason why. Yeah, this one. So I think a lot of this have the uh, observation and also results from the uh, presentation from Dr. Fauci. Yeah. 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 Okay. So you have a very a very happy job not to be overshadowed by the big work and comprehensive by um, uh, Oji because I'm friends. I don't have to put the proper. So um, the main thing on this is that there are so many regulations that we have on the uh, agrarian conflicts and the recognitions, but as like other problems is that we are lacking of um, um, law enforcement. And there are a lot of contesting on this. There are loops at the national and the provincial level that you could probably tap into to contribute into your uh, identifications of what is lacking in the agrarian. So that I would recommend on the side that would be Rio and um, Central Kalimantan and the West Kalimantan with the uh, note of emphasize on Rio and Central Kalimantan where the provincial and some of the properties have more sensitivity in terms of um, contribution to regulations at the, the province. So there is a perda yeah. that uh, is coming out that you can probably contribute to that because I see your contribution. Yeah. I think uh, there is a confusion. I'm, I'm reading part of your draft is that we, we have these large problems um, and uh, very complex and agrarian and for us. The two are interconnected, but um, this, I don't know, this is just wondering, I'm not suggesting which one would be, but if you want to zoom out or zoom in, because it doesn't matter what it is, even if you take it as a plantation, it will go eventually to the context of uh, power relationships, um, historical problems on agrarian, the um, uncertainties on forest uh, status, and um, also very importantly as the use of all of these uncertainties into current uh, political um, conflicting interests. So it's, I don't know how you're going to formulate that, so I have, I have uh, my, um, I honor people who are going to uh, research into that. And then, on the um, key drivers, key drivers of agrarian conflict, is I think there is a um, contribution from the private sectors oh, yeah. that are largely have been using the complexity of uncertainties on the uh, other regulations, and it's also the use of rights and abuse of power at all level by the uh, corporates and, and because that would define the definition of environmental injustice and also on the uh, ecological politics on that and that would be the uh, international and transnational corporate even on oil palm and then uh, the, on the next uh, your key questions and contribution. Research questions? Yes. Oh, sorry. And the research questions, um, 
what conditions and actions need to occur for injustice and conflicts to be ultimately ameliorated? And then the other one. There are moves of um, corporate government and also an area of multi-stakeholders to um, resolve conflicts through mediation. But I define it into two. One is within court and outside court. The one that is very interesting and how um, will be much more interesting to put it into scientific studies within this as how the um, out of court settlement can happen. Uh, this uh, you can probably back to your site is to Riau. It has been uh, a strong movement on that where a company like Asia Pop and Paper through its policy on forest conservation uh, has is a, a mechanism where they're going to put common funds to resolve conflicts with communities. So whether that would result in violence or non-violent or um, peaceful way of resolving it, it remains a question, but methodologically it should be um, the resource should be free to access for communities so that they're not feeling that they were bought by the company to agree on the agenda of the settlement. Um, there is an increasing um, activities also by, by, by five big companies that are responsible for 90% of the whole oil palm supplies. And this is called the Indonesian clutch of oil palm in which uh, Golden Agri Resource uh, Asian Agri, Asian Agri, Wilmar, to other is uh, Musimas and Cargill, they're putting resource together and they want to uh, achieve increase of production without destroying the uh, forest. So no deforestation, no peatland degradation, and no conflict. So we just very timely to this, but you know, it's, it's probably a good uh, session of interview with uh, the active actors at the moment. Um, I think that's about what I can get from your presentation, but um, I'm willing to discuss further into that. But I suggest to get focused rather than having the whole area of agreement. Thank you, Buffy, for uh, very little comments. Now we uh, would like to ask Buffy uh, to give the comment. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, much of such very interesting here, uh, interesting presentation, and I think we we have seen something really a bit. Uh, what do you call it? And something that maybe many people actually here do not, do not really realize how actually precisely it works. And uh, the assessment of this uh, of this study, I think this this, this approach, I think is quite new for Indonesia probably as well. So I think it could be actually uh, I can see it actually from two two perspectives actually here. I think you're trying to to develop a new model or, or new methodology and using maybe a new tool as well. And then, uh, but you haven't presented uh, presented precisely what it has been done before by Indonesian agencies, for instance. You are talking about two agencies and how actually this approach can be integrated to existing uh, models or tools that they're using in the Indonesia. Uh, so that's actually the, the, the question. The first approach and how it can, can be integrated to Indonesian models, current existing models in Indonesia. Uh, I think this the technology what we are presenting actually is very uh, highly sophisticated technology. I think my feeling is Indonesia can learn from this kind of model. I think that's very good as well. Uh, uh, we learn about this GPS uh, network system actually is established already as I think since the tsunami and the boys and uh, several points as well on land as well around in Java and Sumatra I think it's mainly Java uh, now the question is now back again to the point of you mentioned already at the end whether the data can really cover all of the issues I think that the assessment, the prediction, the forecast that you're doing at the moment so thinking about one of the 20 points and you mentioned about West Java was probably affected by the subduction actually there, uh, the, 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 
the interaction between Australia plate and Indonesia and some of the some of the Sunda trends there. So maybe that can be a sort of big factor that maybe can completely destroy the whole assessment if it is a to get it from the point. So then maybe you need to create sort of uh, new constraints, limitations there, how to really uh, uh, which job can be seen from, from uh, your, your approach. Or maybe when I get it fast, how actually you can separate West Java from a non West Java area, for instance. Uh, with the Java up to the West and North area, you mentioned about the movement of plate as well. Uh, looking at the, 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 the velocity movement, it's completely, completely different. So that's really the thing. Uh, and in that sense as well, there's a question you didn't mention about recommendations actually here. Except that you said actually maybe we need to. I'm talking about an organization approach. Your your, uh, your your presentation was mainly about the technology itself. So how actually really you can include your agency? Uh, what capacities the university, the Jamaica person has? I know that BBPT, uh, uh, BBPT, LIP are also very strong in, in, in doing this kind of research as well. And how actually those. Organization structures can also can be involved in, in doing this kind of assessment as well. It's good to be included into your study as well. And maybe it's good also to explain why here the selection of the gamut block, block key actually selected actually here as well. You should mention that as well. The reason why using that kind of model, uh, and I think I can suggest as well, you can include that too finding on the existing models that Indonesia is using as well at the moment. So whether they're using the same model or not, the same uh, technology or not, uh, uh, I think that's it. And uh, the, the always the challenge actually here as well, whether, what's the minimum number, or, or you mentioned about 120 GPS observations, and you mentioned about that 120 points that you're using at the moment can cover up below sub to 80, I think, 90, 68, 68, 68 kilometers down south. And, and looking at actually, and that's not an issue as well, because you're thinking about 120 points, and 8, 68 actually very low below the, 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 the coastal line from, from Java, and you only have 120 points, and the question is now, how can this 120 points, or how can 1,000, for instance, points, that really can forecast? The, the incoming actually earthquake in several points. Especially you mentioned about when you're talking about lockings, then it is about really about timing. It's not about what, the, how quick actually that locking is actually happening through your GPS, space or GPS accuracy uh, the testing. If you have, let's say, for instance, uh, uh, the locking, the observation starts, let's say, two years ago, and the locking is improving in the next, let's say, two or five years. So how do you predict that there will be a earthquake in that point 15 years from now, from today? And that's a question as well that you need to put actually in that thing. Probably to add more variable, those kind of lockings can be really uh, forecast as well in terms of timing. Uh, I think that's actually I'm going to get added in the discussion. Thank you very much. I forgot yes. this. <laughs> Well, that's the one is um, institutionalize, institutionalizing the uh, conflict resolution. And on that notion, I'd like to promote women minister. As um, Minister Situ Nurbaya Bakar has formed the uh, National Task Force on Conflict Resolution. And that probably can fit into that as well, too. As the, there will be a new um, presidential regulations on uh, one map and the mini one map to be applied within Riau and that would be including in it as their conflict resolution in terms of matching the um, community mappings into province and national level one map. And then the third one is the um, um, memorandum of agreement among 29 ministries and state agencies. This is under the coordinations uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with the Presidential Office and the Anti-Corruption Commission on Penyelamatan Sumber Daya Alam. 
And within that, there is also a conflict resolution that, resolution that is very vibrant on it. So that would be uh, factors as well that would influence the outcome of your research. Thank you. Thank you, Afi and Patrick, for the fastest comments. Uh, before we open uh, this uh, question and answer from the floor, I would like to uh, uh, give the time for the two speakers to respond to the comments. The short comment, please. Yeah. Uh, the first time. Yeah, I think, uh, thank you so much, Fafi. Uh, really great uh, feedback on that. Uh, I think uh, when first it's about some elements that I have to look at uh, from these researches, I think it's true that this is actually what uh, I really want to look at. It's not, this is, I mean, when we look at some key drivers, uh, we cannot simplify uh, agrarian conflict into these key drivers. There are a lot of uh, processes and on the ground that make these injustices can happen, conflict can happen. So that's what, yeah, it's really, this is what I want to look at as well. And also about the sites, I agree that Riau and Central Kalimantan is uh, the highest uh, number of agrarian conflict are there. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, it's good. Uh, the West Kalimantan has solution. Sorry? West Kalimantan has Oh, yeah, just has part uh, on. No, but it's also the resolution on the uh, conflict for when the uh, golden agri resources okay. the community. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's uh, yeah, it's good that because I am looking for some uh, case studies that has been successfully resolved and also some case studies that maybe not really successful. So we can compare uh, what what work and what doesn't work in the process of conflict management. And also about looking at some perda and uh, and about the focus. I think it's true that I need to be more focused here. I still look at I, I, I'm still, this may be just my interest to look at both uh, oil farm and also uh, forestry plantation or HTI. But maybe it'd be good if I just focus on one, uh, maybe just oil farm. If I have to just between two, maybe I will focus on oil farm. It's already big. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think, um, and other things about uh, looking at the current trends, it's true that I can see that there is a growing trend of using extra legal processes to resolve conflict, which is more accessible for different actors, uh, especially mediation in Riau. Uh, scale up or EMN in impartial mediator network. Yes. Yeah. So I agree with, with you. Thank you so much for your. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much uh, for the suggestions. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would like to respond for some issues here uh, about uh, mentioning how a model can be integrated into the network. I think that would be very interesting to see that uh, the geodetic approach on these studies like geophysical process or earthquake is on the early years in Indonesia actually it's not very mature. So um, in previous assessments, uh, the approach actually haven't been used on, 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 on developing the, for example, this um, map, seismic map hazard for Indonesia because uh, the number of the measurements and the development of the uh, the development of the continuous stations just 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 being installed. So yeah, that's that's one problem. And about um, the technical issue on west and north of Java, actually that would be interesting to to make a distinction. Yeah, uh, that's that's. I would like to do next to, to separate them from the whole body of Java and to make it a distinctive uh, block and see how well the, the network can resolve the block. But the problem is actually uh, we have that uh, the depth of the Zadat in play is actually is already very deep on the mainland of Java and it's not very deep beneficial in Java because we don't have uh, the islands like in Sumatra 
like for example uh, Mias and Mantawai, which is near to the trans actually, and we can derive the locking pattern on the cellular part of the trans. So it's quite challenging in Java, and I'm, I don't think that GPS can fully really resolve from the uh, until the cellular part of the trans. I think we need to use another constraint for doing that. Yeah, but, but that's this an interesting approach. And about adding more fair, variable on the forecast, yeah, I guess that should be mentioned as well on my research um, because um, yeah, we, we have um, only like eight years of data from the very first uh, of measurement, and we don't know how long. The, the, the strain has been accumulated, so we'll, we will need an initial study to assess, assess this thing first, and yeah, that's, that's quite challenging, and there are many things that need to be investigated more, I guess, because my GPS velocity, uh, I don't think, um, according to my study, there are not many reliable studies about the Active for motion in, in Java actually it's, it's uh, very unfortunate. Yeah. While we the we have everything in Java, I <laughs> mean we, we don't have much knowledge on Java. Why? And, um, um, I think it's because the the tectonic process in Java compared to Sumatra, for example, is very low. That's that I think that's the first. The, the initial, the initial <coughs> sense of a researcher, but yeah, I try to move to to some area that haven't been looked out by the others and try to, to see. And actually, I need some validation from other approach yeah. to, to compare my solution. Talk, talking about validation, uh, we know that the, the, the American system is very sophisticated. They use at least twenty four satellites to check the accuracy, and also the atomic clock is very accurate yeah. because we were talking about first synapse. Velocity here, yeah. and then the, the movement, and also the, 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 the dynamic level of those variables as well. So you're using actually the same, I mean, like American model or GPS technology here. So now the question is, if you know, is, do you think that Indonesia will be using the same GPS measurement as well? Because we have also our own satellites there. And how how do you how do you listen the government is actually collecting this um, GPS uh, accuracy data number? Yeah. Position, location, and everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, actually, um, only numbers of countries that develop such such system actually. Uh, only limited countries like uh, European mm -hmm. Union, mm -hmm. European Union, the China, Japan, India, and I think Russia develop the same system. Mm -hmm. But the data is actually free to be oh, accessed by the public okay. as long as we have the receivers. Yeah. So that's, that's, yeah. uh, okay, uh, now we open a uh, question and answer from the floor because uh, the time constraint. I would like to only raise uh, one or two questions from the floor. If you have any question, please raise your hand, introduce and sort yourself and be so. First, Yogi and uh, Yogi. Thank you for the uh, as the layman audience and one of the uh, 2006 Jogja Earth Tour victims, I just wondering uh, if uh, Yosa can predict if the Jogja earthquake can happen again, and if you and if you can predict uh, that the earthquake will happen again, when <laughs> the, the earthquake will be happen, and so we can prepare uh, to invest the earthquake first. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <coughs> I Jack Manchin, my name, I'm from the Australian Catholic Charity Organization. I'd like to ask the same question about the A few years ago, I went to Flores, Island of Flores, and I met Professor, professor Tom Terrick. He's a professor, he passed away already, he started AMU, and with his other colleague from Austin. So, uh, I went to France for, of course, <coughs> charity. But, and then we discussed, I said, asked him, what your you know, visit here in Florence? Apparently, he, he uh, 
from Australia and the World Bank, I think, send them to Flores because of the earthquake in Flores. If it happened a few years ago, he explained that Flores, you know, the uh, plate, the Flores is very close. Or, so he gave a predict that in 30 or 40 years' time, the island of Flores will disappear. Now, my question is, well, it was years ago, and of course, when the two uh, experts from Australia <coughs> talked to the people, and of course they laughed at them because 90% of the Flores people are Catholic. They said, you don't believe at all. So I just want to ask, how come they can make a prediction so they for this time? I have and of course, they uh, visit there us to encourage the local government to move people for us two million to Impossible. How are you going to move to up two million to Java or to Gary Allen? So my question is, have you, well, you and Aspen and Earthquake, is still that prediction about forest going to disappear? Oh. <laughs> 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 to your side. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, uh, first question, Mr. Uh, Yogi, about the prediction on your Java Earthquake. Uh, the thing that we need to have in mind that the mechanism of the Jogjakarta earthquake is not from the subduction zone actually, from the Java trends. It's not the truss mechan mechanism, which is uh, actually is the scope of my research. But in, in Jogjakarta, the um, opaque fault is still quite active actually. And we need to do more measurement on that area, as I've mentioned that um, we we have uh, we are on the early stage of doing assessment. I think the wake up call is from the 2004 Sumatra earthquake, and this just been done for several years. And we, we need to 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 put some more parameters, more variables to extend on that. But well, I think the the magnitude of the earthquake in in Jogja is quite low. But the, the problem is not about the magnitude, but the sedimentation in Jogja, actually. Uh, that, 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 that somehow amplified the magnitude of the earthquake. So the, the prediction on, 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 on Jogjakarta earthquake um, need, needs to be carried out from some measurement. And I, I don't have much detail on that, actually. Yeah. <coughs> and about the Flores, the Flores, um, the Flores and Java has very distinctive structure, uh, geological structure, while in Java uh, the oceanic crust of the Australian plate is subducting. In the Flores, in the east of New South Tenggara, it's the continent plate of the, 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 the Australian plate is subducting the, the Flores. And that creates a back thrust on the north of the island which triggered the tsunami in Maumere, I guess, in 19-something, yeah, I forgot. But, yeah, that's, that's the mechanism in, 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 in Flores. Uh, suggesting about wh 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 whether the uh, Flores will disappear, well, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> because according to our study, I, we, we, we do some, uh, some study, uh, uh, um, a focus study in, in East of Nusa Tenggara in Java as well. And uh, we, we, we just, we just uh, do some early stage of research, but the velocity doesn't show that the, the present tectonic setting of Flores will show that the island will disappear. So, so yeah, that's, that's, I, I don't think that. that, 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 that. OK, uh, we finally come to the end of the first session. Once more, I would like to thanks to uh, the speakers and the discussion for an interesting presentation and valuable comments. Thanks also for all of you uh, for very active and participation participant. Hopefully, this session will be beneficial for us. Uh, please be with me to give a big applause for the that's it. Uh, Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.